Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Hope everybody can hear me. Um, my name is Chris Gobler. I'm a professor at Stony Brook University. Um, I run the Gobler Lab out of Stony Brook, Southampton. And uh, normally, I would give this presentation, uh, the State of the Bay's presentation, on the Stony Brook, Southampton campus with uh, my students with me and many students giving poster presentations, usually about a dozen of those, uh, with wonderful interaction with the public who comes. And uh, it's a great opportunity for uh, the students to be able to interact with the public and for people to get to know that people are actually doing all the research. Um, but obviously we're under different circumstances this year. Um, and so uh, we're doing a Zoom meeting, but you know, perhaps that's more convenient. I know there are some people who often say they'd like to attend, but they can't because they are, uh, Southampton's too far. And so uh, now you don't need to drive to Southampton. You're going to be able to hear this presentation uh, right here, right now. And so I do appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, the way this presentation will go is that I'm um, not going to stop for questions. I'm going to give the presentation straight through. Um, but at the end, I will uh, stop and you'll have the opportunity to raise your hand. I'll tell you how to do that. Uh, and when you do that, I will uh, be able to unmute you and then you can ask your question and I'll be able to answer it. So as I go, maybe you have a piece of paper and you can scratch down questions you might have. And again, happy to answer those in the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to get started. Um, and start by expressing my sincere appreciation uh, to members of the Gobler Lab. Um, you know, really these students and these fine scientists and research technicians are the people who really make this research happen. Um, and so you can see a picture of them here. And um, I really express my sincere gratitude to all of them. It's a, it's a distinct pleasure to work with every single one of them from the undergraduates through the graduate students and the, uh, research technicians and postdoctoral scholars. Um, and again, they are the boots on the ground, the fins in the water that really make all this research happen. Um, and if you want to keep track with us or keep track of what we're up to, uh, we do have social media accounts now across multiple platforms. So we would encourage you to look up Global Lab in um, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, and you can follow uh, the things that we're up to, both locally here on Long Island and also our research uh, that is published in peer reviewed journals around the world. So, with that, I'll start with the first topic of the day um, and just the most important topic of the whole presentation the concept of Long Island as a watershed. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this concept, but frankly, it couldn't be more important to emphasize. And so I'm going to do that right now with this wonderful figure from Woods Hole Oceanographic that I've modified uh, to make clearer what, why it's important for Long Island. Uh, of course, the idea of a watershed is that anything, any water that falls on the land ultimately is going to have uh, three potential and all very important fates. Uh, that water will either recharge our groundwater, as you can see here, uh, in which case uh, it's going to be influenced by all the activity on land. So that may be agriculture, uh, that may be uh, septic tanks that are influencing in, uh, the uh, quality of the groundwater, and eventually that groundwater will seep out into coastal waters. Uh, but before it does that, very importantly here in Long Island, that same groundwater is our drinking water. And so anything we are doing on land is affecting the water that we drink every single day. Everybody on Long Island is drinking water from our groundwater. And it's the leftover water that then discharges into our surface waters. So any activity on land, be it agriculture, septic systems, uh, industrial, is influencing both our uh, drinking water supply and our surface water. Um, and as I'll try to emphasize throughout the presentation, uh, they all have important consequences for us here on Long Island. Um, if we look at Suffolk County specifically, and we see how this county has changed over the last uh, century or so, you can see the 
enormous population growth through the 20th century into this century. Uh, and concurrently, you can see what's happened with regards to our uh, groundwater. And this is the average levels of nitrate in groundwater as measured by the Suffolk County Department of Health Services uh, with the most recent data point here from 2018. Uh, and you can see the very linear trajectory that the nitrogen levels are on. They just keep increasing and the uh, modeling has suggest that this linear increase is not going to slow down anytime soon. And maybe a few years ago, we might have been in a situation where we might have been guessing, why is that? What's causing this increase in nitrogen? Uh, but the studies are in and we now know that the primary source of nitrogen to groundwater in Suffolk County, um, and I, you'll see later that it's also for the North Shore of Nassau County, is on-site wastewater. And the fact that 70% of Suffolk County is unsewered and therefore the on-site systems are leaching their contents um, from the uh, from these individual systems into our groundwater. Uh, there is a contribution, of course, from fertilizer, but it's smaller um, compared to what's coming from wastewater. Of course, it varies from system to system, uh, but by and large, it's about, on average, for Suffolk County, somewhere around 60 to 70% of the nitrogen in groundwater is coming from these on-site wastewater systems. And, of course, we know that, as I introduced with regards to the watershed, concept. Uh, this excessive nitrogen is having effects in our coastal waters uh, all across Long Island, from Montauk all the way out to New York City, of course. And so what this map shows is data from 2019, and that's what the State of a Bay's address really is about, is sort of reviewing what happened the year prior, and then talking about what may, may be happening in the future. Um, so this is a map that uh, indicates the occurrence of either low oxygen conditions in the blue, across Long Island, or harmful algal blooms, which are all the other different colors, uh, except for the yellow, which are fish kills. And I want to emphasize, these are all events that occurred in a short period of time, essentially between May and September of 2019. And you can see, really, there was not a major water body across Long Island that was not affected by either hypoxia, harmful algal blooms, or both. Uh, and we know through the years, the, the effects that these things can have on various uh, fisheries and shell fisheries and important critical habitats such as seagrasses uh, and wetlands and even fisheries like the, uh, the winter flounder, for example. Um, won't go into the details on that today. I will now though, however, talk about these harmful algal blooms, which can be broken up into essentially two different classes. We have harmful algal blooms that occur in surface waters uh, that make biotoxins. As you can see here, uh, alexandrium, dinophysis, blue-green algae. I'll talk more about all three of these. Uh, and these are a threat to both public health and even to our pets. Uh, and then a whole other class of harmful algal blooms are thankfully not a threat to human health. However, they are dangerous and actually, frankly, lethal to many of our important fisheries and shell fisheries here on Long Island. And during the last decade, there's been a series, as you can see here, of publications that essentially have established that high levels of nitrogen will lead to these harmful algal blooms either being more intense or more toxic. Uh, many of the toxic compounds themselves are nitrogen-rich molecules, and the research that's been done both in Long Island and across the world, frankly, has established the link between high nitrogen concentrations and high levels of toxins. Now, this is research, as you can see, that's been done over the last decade. But as I told you, I want to really emphasize 2019. It's the most recent results that we have. And so let me give you an example of, for example, um, some experiments that we did in a place called Conscience Bay. So this is an area on the north shore of Long Island, not far from Stony Brook. We did experiments, you can see, during June, July, August, September, very simple experiments where we took bay water we did nothing to it, or we added nitrogen, or phosphorus, or both compounds. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the levels of chlorophyll uh, in micrograms per liter. And the EPA and NOAA would both tell you that above 20 micrograms per liter is what is known as the eutrophic threshold for coastal waters. And what the results show is that, with the exception of June, during the months of July, August, and September, adding more nitrogen 
led to a doubling, or in some cases a tripling, of the amount of chlorophyll in the water. Um, and going from the level that really you don't want to go above to a level far above that, and a level that we know will cause further impairment of water bodies. Now this is Conscience Bay, but I can show you the same data set essentially from Sag Harbor. And again, we did the same month, same experiments, and frankly the same results. We skipped over nitrogen and phosphorus, but the fact that the bars look the same here and the last experiment shows you that the outcome of going from the level you don't want to exceed to a level far beyond that is driven by the addition of nitrogen. And it even occurs in freshwater bodies. We've done this for years, but just again to show a 2019 example, here's an experiment in Lake Agawam uh, in Southampton, adding nothing, here's the initial levels, the control levels, adding nitrogen, phosphorus, elevating temperatures. And um, I think it should be clear to everyone, it's the addition of nitrogen that led to an increase in the levels of blue-green algae, specifically also known as cyanobacteria, in this experiment. So these results are not new. We've had these year after year. I'm just again showing an example of what we saw uh, in 2019, and I'm sure we'll see the same thing this year, just like we've seen every single year. To talk about some of these individual harmful algal blooms, um, I'm gonna start with talking about uh, Alexandrium, shown here, probably one of the most uh, dangerous of the harmful algal blooms because it makes this compound saxitoxin. This is a neurotoxin that's 1,000 times more potent than cyanide. And you can see, as I forecasted and told you before, it is a nitrogen-rich compound. You don't need to be an organic chemist to see all the nitrogen within this compound. And again, when you add more nitrogen to these cells, they make more of this compound. This organism is widespread across Long Island. Um, it's led to closures of shellfish beds uh, through the decades, more than a dozen sites. Uh, it also led to the die-off of hundreds of dimebag terrapin turtles. That uh, was published on uh, 2017. Uh, the die-off was in 2015. And last year, uh, we had a closure of North Port Harbor uh, due to high levels of toxins from Alexandrium in shellfish. And we also had a closure in the Peconic Estuary in both Terry and Meeting House Creek. These are, uh, neither of these are first time events. Um, these are repeat occurrences in these particular estuaries. Another toxic algal bloom that we have on Long Island is Dinophysis. It makes ochidaic acid, um, not a nitrogen rich compound, but this organism, is, organism itself is more responsive to nitrogen probably than any of the other harmful algal blooms. Uh, Teresa Hattenrath published on that twice in 2015 in both Limnology Oceanography and the journal PLOS One. This organism, again, is widespread across Long Island. And in 2019, uh, New York actually had its first ever closure of a shellfish bed due to a dinophysis bloom. This happened off a tributary of Shinnecock Bay known as Old Fort Pond. So this was a new organism a few years ago, but now we're having these events every single year. Um, I told you I'm gonna mainly focus on 2019, but if you want a 2020 update as of this afternoon, we have harmful algal blooms sort of erupting, I would say, in multiple tributaries across Long Island. Reports again in Old Fort Pond. Here's the water that was pulled out of there yesterday with tens of thousands of um, protocentral minimum cells per milliliter. Uh, this has also been reported in um, Great River on Great South Bay and multiple other locations. Uh, and this organism is well known to be lethal to bivalves, leads to low oxygen conditions, and the literature is pretty clear that this organism is promoted by high levels of nitrogen. Now, thankfully, we live in an area where actually the local government and agencies care a lot about these harmful algal blooms. And in an exciting news update, uh, both New York Sea Grant has been collaborating with Suffolk County Department of Health Services to come up with a new harmful algal bloom reporting system. So if you're interested in that, you should take note of this website. Uh, this is for marine waters only. If you want to report freshwater harmful algal blooms, you can do that through the DEC. Uh, but Sea Grant is heading up this effort to report marine harmful algal blooms. Again, there's the website. If you go to that website, uh, there'll be an opportunity to fill in uh, a form specifically about what was seen and where, and that will alert Suffolk County Department of Health Services. Um, and frankly, we, my lab collaborates with them. So we'll work with Suffolk County Department of Health Services to look into what might be driving that harmful algal bloom. 
Um, and oftentimes that can be useful in then finding uh, an area that may need to be studied further or may require the DEC to look at shellfish, for example. Uh, so it will guide future decisions. It's going to assist an ongoing mapping effort by Suffolk County uh, and it was part of Suffolk County's Harmful Algal Bloom Action Plan uh, that was initiated by the Bologna administration uh, as part of their Reclaim Our Waters. So if you want more information, you can email Mike Jensen at Suffolk County Department of Health Services. And again, there's the uh, website. Now, sometimes you need to be a scientist to identify harmful algal blooms. And so you might take a picture and you know, we'd look under a microscope, we might analyze things with DNA, but other times you can look at the water and you can know something is not right. And so here's an example of that uh, from Great South Bay last September. Uh, this was um, an area near Islip, but frankly there were areas all across the South Shore uh, that looked just like this. And um, the news is that this is not a native organism. This is actually what is known as an invasive species. So I'm gonna tell you a short story about an invasion that's occurred on Long Island in just the past few years, frankly, right under our noses. This organism, as you can see, is known as Daisy Siphona, Daisy Siphona uh, japonica. And the japonica is for Japan because this is actually a seaweed that's native to the Pacific Ocean and around uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but here it is showing up on Long Island. You might ask how. Well, it actually began invading Europe in the 80s. And you can see that through the 80s and into the 90s, it spread across multiple parts of Europe uh, and into even this century, moving a little bit north. Uh, and then not long ago, only 13 years ago, observed for the first time in the Northeast U.S., spreading <laughs> throughout our region, uh, or the closest region to us, up until what I'm about to tell you about was Rhode Island. And now we, we now know this organism is now widespread, at least across the south shore of Long Island. There's a survey that was done by Craig Young, a senior lab technician in my lab, on this survey last fall. And you can see the organism at that point in time was widespread, covering much of the bottom, all across Great South Bay into Mauritius Bay, across Eastern Shinnecock Bay, and even into the Peconic Estuary. And those pictures that we showed you were from uh, the region between um, Bayshore and Isle. Again, this is another picture from the same exact event. Again, you don't need to be a scientist to know this is problematic, and I'll show you uh, why it indeed is problematic. But one question is, why is it here? How, why did it spread to Long Island? Well, uh, again, Mr. Craig Young in my lab has been doing research on this over the past year. He's conducted dozens of experiments month after month, uh, and the results he gets are pretty similar. Either he's seen an addition of nitrogen and phosphorus together increasing their growth, an addition of CO2 doing it, and an additive effect. So high levels of CO2 and high levels of nitrogen leading to a growth rate uh, that's more than double what the ambient growth rate would be. This is a disturbing trend, um, and again, this is something he found again and again. Uh, nutrients seemingly more important during the warmer months, carbon dioxide more important during the cooler months, uh, consistent with what we know about the ambient levels within the water. Now, the question is, if this is coming from nitrogen, where is the nitrogen coming from? And so during that same survey you saw before, Craig Young collected samples from locations all across the South Shore. And you can see this is the same exact survey that started in Great South Bay and went all the way into Shinnecock Bay. And then we performed uh, isotopic analysis, essentially looking at the ratio of nitrogen 15 to 14 in the tissue. And by doing that, you can essentially differentiate two types of signals. You can differentiate fertilizer or the atmosphere or wastewater. If the source of nitrogen is fertilizer, you get a signal of about minus three. The atmosphere is around zero. 100% wastewater signal is 10. And you can see what the signal is. In most cases, we're getting a signal that's 90 to 100% wastewater. Uh, and even when it's not that much, it's very much the large majority of the nitrogen that's being taken up by this invasive seaweed is from wastewater. So we have wastewater derived nitrogen. And again, most of these regions are areas that are unsewered. So we have septic systems 
leaching nitrogen to groundwater. It's being taken up by this seaweed. So far, if you just look at these pictures, all I've showed you is that, well, it doesn't, it's not pretty. You don't want to look at it. Uh, maybe it's perfectly harmless. And that's what we might have assumed at first. Uh, but Craig Young's also been doing some experiments in our lab. Here's the results of some of those experiments. And because of the way the water looked here, we've been both looking at the live algae itself, but also when you get these decay events. What happens when the organism dies? Um, and so here's an assay with um, the inland silver side, and essentially showing that when you expose the silver side to the live algae, most of them survive. But when you expose them to the algae that's decaying, you get about 100% mortality in one week. Now, very importantly, we've, we've refined these experiments over time. We are bubbling these rigorously. So this is not a low oxygen effect. We're measuring the levels of ammonium. They're not in toxic range. So there's some sort of additional compound coming from the seaweed that's lethal to fish. We've also done experiments with hard clams, and specifically hard clam larvae, where we have larvae that are under a control setting, exposed to live daisy sulfona, or the, again, decayed and filtered daisy sulfona. And you can see the outcome here. In one week time, whether the larvae are fed or not fed, um, you're losing more than half of the hard clam larvae when exposed to that filtered and decayed daisy, daisy sulfona. Uh, and that decay is obvious. Uh, the pictures I showed you before were for September 2019. Here are some shoreline pictures of decay in 2018 that looked like this during the first week of decay and looked like this the next week later. And concurrent with that was an event um, we dubbed the big seaweed stink because what we saw is that the seaweeds grew very well in the early summer but then died and then washed up on the shoreline and released a lot of sulfur gas. So the de health department got multiple complaints, both in the South Shore uh, along Fire Island, but also on the North Shore of Great South Bay uh, and other regions where you saw the water looked like this and the sulfur uh, was being admitted. Now, one might just say, oh, that smells bad. Well, that's too bad. We, we, we don't like smell, but at least it just smells bad. Well, actually, there's emerging medical evidence that this bad smell from seaweeds can actually have very serious consequences. So this is a paper from the, it was published in the journal The Lancet, which is the second most influential medical journal in the world, uh, essentially that looked at the effects of seaweeds washing up on shorelines. This was in the Caribbean with sargassum, um, and essentially listing the uh, medical effects of the hydrogen sulfide from the seaweeds. And you can see what this medical report uh, let, uh, reported on, the medical journal reported on specifically. Um, you can see here, hypoxic pulmonary and neurological and cardiovascular lesions, um, irritation, uh, irritation of airways, headaches, um, memory loss. Uh, and in a, you can see here, an eight month period in the island of Mar Mar Martinique, uh, there were more than 8,000 emergency room cases of people with acute exposure to sulfur from these seaweeds, uh, with at least three patients being admitted to intensive care. Um, so while sulfur smells bad, there are well-known consequences from them. Um, and similarly to this, within, for example, in Europe, there have been reports of both animals and people dying from exposure to sulfur gas from seaweed. So seaweeds uh, you know, normally aren't a big problem, but when you get a large overgrowth and they wash up on shore, there is a health concern. So just wrapping up this section on daisy sulfona, we now know it's widespread across Long Island. It's being driven by wastewater derived nitrogen and also carbon dioxide. Um, we know that the decaying daisy sulfona results in mortality of both larval fish and larval shellfish. And we know that the daisy sulfona is a public health. So this is what I would call a new harmful algal bloom for Long Island. Moving out of marine waters, we know that freshwater systems in Long Island are also vulnerable to harmful algal blooms. Um, and here is a picture of one. This is Lake Agawam in Southampton. You can see the green water contrasting with the blue ocean water. Um, and this is just really emblematic of multiple systems like this across Long Island. So I'll show you momentarily. We worry about these organisms because they make compounds like microcystin, 
um, before it was called microcystin. The official first name of microcystin in the scientific literature was called fast death factor. Uh, and then it was renamed in the 60s microcystin. Um, you can see here again, this is a nitrogen rich compound. Uh, it's loaded with, it depends on the conjure you have, but it can, some conjures can have up to 10 atoms of nitrogen per molecule. So again, you get the effect, more nitrogen allows the organism to make more of these toxins, very well established in the literature. Uh, and this is a uh, slide from the environmental working group, essentially showing the potential short-term and long-term health effects associated with microcystin. And because of these health effects, that's why the EPA now has advi advisory levels for microcystin and also the cyanobacterial toxin known as cylindrospermopsin. And you can see a very low health threshold level for microcystins. Uh, this is for drinking water, but they also have regulatory limits um, for recreational waters as well. Of course, we don't drink our lake water in Long Island, but we do recreate. Uh, and we like to bring our pets to areas to recreate, and that's a concern. Uh, this paper by the CDC, published not long ago, reported on hundreds of cases of dogs being poisoned by blue-green algae. And we know this has happened in Long Island. The Department of Health, New York State Department of Health, recorded a dog death in 2012 uh, due to blue-green algae, and the Suffolk County Department of Health has uh, responded to dog illnesses uh, on an almost every year basis, at least once, uh, due to freshwater blue-green algae blooms. And last year in particular was particularly deadly across the United States for dogs with regards to blue-green algae. In fact, there was one week last August uh, where there were 10 dogs that died in four states across the United States. So this is a serious issue for, um, for pets and specifically for dogs. And it's a nationwide issue. The Environmental Working Group put together this national map of blue-green algae. And you can see when it comes to New York, there are many, many, many places uh, that are being reported on. And you might think it's, we have many blooms, and we do. Uh, but I can also say we've got a Department of Environmental Conservation that is vigilantly, vigilantly tracking these blooms um, starting now and going to the fall. Uh, and in fact, they track them in every single county in New York. And if you look at every county across New York and you look at all the data, uh, what you end up finding out is that in 2019, there were more blue green algae blooms in Suffolk County than in any other county across the entire state. Um, and this is a trend actually that has been held, I would say for at least the past five years. And probably more so even than the marine blooms, these blue green algae blooms are promoted very, very strongly and directly promoted by high levels of nutrients. Um, and both, it's both nitrogen and phosphorus, and that's why the EPA calls what they call dual nutrient criteria for freshwater bodies to control these harmful algal blooms. We often would think of them as being promoted by phosphorus, but we now know that nitrogen, uh, particularly the types we have here in Long Island, that are what we call non-diazotrophic. They don't fix their own nitrogen, and therefore they're promoted by nitrogen. Beyond harmful algal blooms, um, our monitoring across Long Island by the Gober Lab, um, in a collaboration with News 12, has looked at other water water quality characteristics from places from Montauk all the way out to Nassau County. Um, and for six years, was reported on the Thursday evening weather forecasts, uh, starting in May and going to September. Um, due to the current restrictions, those reports will not start until July 4th this year, but we do look to restart those. Um, and in doing that, one of the things we've really focused on is the occurrence of low oxygen. Um, low oxygen can occur when you have the overgrowth of phytoplankton that then break down and results in the consumption of oxygen and the production of CO2. Uh, but that oxygen consumption is what the DEC worries a lot about in marine waters. And that's why they have a standard where they don't really want to see the levels below 4.8 milligrams per liter. Uh, and they never want to see them below 3 milligrams per liter. And in our monitoring for News 12 all across Long Island, what we've actually seen is that many of the locations we're monitoring actually don't make that DEC standard. And so, for example, you can see the data here. On average, well, across the five years of sampling, we had 17 sites that we monitored that fell below that three milligram per liter threshold, another half dozen that fell below the 
uh, 4.8 milligram per liter threshold, of uh, MN7 that we were monitoring that stayed above it the whole time. But we know that these low levels of oxygen have consequences. Uh, we're familiar with the very famous fish kills that happen in places like Riverhead uh, and the Shinnecock Canal and almost back-to-back -back years with literally millions of fish expiring. Um, and last year was no exception. In fact, we had an odd week towards the end of August last year where there were three individual fish kills on Shinnecock Bay. You can see the fish here, mostly bunker washing up on shore, but there were other uh, bluefish and snappers also part of um, these fish kills as well. And recently, um, my graduate student Stephen Tomasetti and I published a paper in the journal Science, um, it's actually published just last month. And what this paper pointed out is that both, well, in New York, but really in, across the United States, the policies that exist for the levels of dissolved oxygen and pH are actually leaving our fisheries more at risk than we would suspect otherwise. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details of this paper. Um, you can, I encourage you to look at it. It's, uh, I believe, open access. Again, it was published on April 23rd. Um, but we do list a series of actions that can be taken to modify existing oxygen and uh, pH policies that would have the possibility of reducing the occurrence of fish. And of course, we're familiar with the idea that uh, the, beyond the fish kills, we know that um, last November came a very unfortunate event whereby the scallop fishery essentially collapsed in the Peconic Estuary. Uh, there was almost no harvest whatsoever, um, which is very unfortunate. This is an iconic shellfish for New York and for Long Island. Uh, it had collapsed due to a harmful algal bloom in the 1980s and 1990s. There were tremendous efforts uh, put forth by Cornell University, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, Long Island University, in collaboration with scientists at Stony Brook as well, to bring, 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 it, uh, bring this population back. The effort led by Steve Settlebach that was having success. It brought back the population. Um, but again, a collapse last year once again. Um, and what, do we, what we know from last year is that the levels of algae, the levels of food for these scallops was no different than any other year. So one hypothesis was, well, maybe there wasn't enough nitrogen and therefore not enough algae for the scallops to eat and they starve. Well, the data shows that was not the case. Uh, there was just the same amount of nitrogen as the years actually the population was rebuilding. So we can cross that right off the list. We do know from our monitoring that last summer, Great Peconic Bay got hotter than it had uh, in any year, at least going all the way back to 2014, not a super long record, uh, although we know that today is much warmer than it was, say, in the 70s and 80s. And we know when it gets warmer, the oxygen levels get lower, and that this is stressful for the scout. Uh, we also know, thanks to research at Stony Brook University by Boss Malam, uh, that many of these scallops also had a parasite associated with them that likely also contributed to the mortality, although the manner in which that may have happened is not fully understood, uh, and there are scientists at Stony Brook will be investigating that uh, further this summer. But again, we worried about the hot temperatures and also the low oxygen, uh, and the reports suggest that this year and this summer uh, may be uh, warmer than ever, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens with that. So I'm just going to now move on and take a, a minor detour and talk just about one more aspect when it comes to uh, nitrogen and groundwater and why we might care about that. And so this is again a paper from uh, The Lancet, again the second most prestigious medical journal on the planet, uh, and it looked at, uh, they have a group called the, that, um, see here, the Global Health Data Exchange, and in looking at that they specifically uh, we're looking at what are the causes of death for people around the world. Uh, and you can see things that you would, some things you would expect, but maybe some surprises as well. And the fact that actually pollution was the greatest cause of death. Um, so you can see that there. And just for perspective, as of today, the uh, coronavirus uh, global epidemic has uh, led to mortality of more than uh, 360,000 people as of today, and I'm sure, unfortunately, that's a number that will continue to increase. Uh, but by perspective, 
we should recognize that every year, uh, contamination of water supplies, uh, air and soil, again, this journal concluded, is the leading cause of death globally. Now, I just want to, again, take a sojourn here to look at nitrate in drinking water and why we might care about that beyond just the marine environment. As an oceanographer, I worry about what happens to the marine systems. But as a professor at Stony Brook University, I get to talk to medical doctors at the medical school at Stony Brook University, epidemiologists. And in doing so, we've been talking about what does it mean when you nitrate levels in groundwater are 3.8 milligrams per liter? Here's some data Dr. Stuart Waugh comp uh, compiled from um, uh, Suffolk County Water Authority, different water districts. And you can see this, this mean average here uh, falls right in sort of the median as well, but there are many wells that are far above that. And uh, unfortunately, I actually have firsthand knowledge of this, just a quick personal note, is that since I've moved to East Quag, I have a, uh, my own well, and I've been monitoring the levels of nitrogen there. And the trend I'm seeing is just like we're seeing all across Suffolk County, except accelerated, and except the levels are really, really high. I'm happy to report that actually this week, I'll be getting water from Suffolk County Water Authority, no longer relying on my personal wells. And that's good news. Um, but the levels we see in Suffolk County, uh, you know, we can say, we look at these, we say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's high, but there's some worse and there's some lower. But the shocking thing, comes when you look at where we stand relative to the rest of the United States. So uh, scientists from Duke University published a very important paper last summer that looked at the concentrations of nitrate in the groundwater of US citizens across the whole country. And I'm showing you some of this data here. I encourage you to get this paper if you want more information. And you can see the y-axis here, millions of people. We have a little bit over 300 million people in the United States. What this paper showed is that 200 million of those people have groundwater with less than one milligram per liter. Now another 75 million or so have between one and three milligrams per liter. And then here we are, Suffolk County, at the tail end uh, with the upper 5% of nitrate concentrations. Now, on the one hand, we might say, well, 3.8, that's not bad, and in fact, if we look at what the federal standard is for nitrate, it's 10, we're at 3.8, should be fine. We wouldn't want to be above 10 because that can lead to blue baby syndrome. Um, but again, at Stony Brook University, when you talk to scientists and people in the medical school, people like Professor and Dr. Jamie Melliker, epidemiologist, um, it leads to the question of might there be other health risks from nitrates? And so I just want to very quickly introduce something, uh, a carcinogenic, carcinogenic compound, known as nitrosamines, um, shown here. Now, these are very concentrated in tobacco smoke, and are one of the reasons that uh, tobacco and smoking causes cancer. Um, unfortunately, these same exact compounds are formed in the intestines, in the stomach, when you consume nitrate. Um, it depends on certain conditions, but that's the reason why there's an organization called the International Agency for research on cancer, it's part of the World Health Organization, that classifies nitrates and nitrate, nitrites as probable carcin carcinogenic, probably carcinogenic to humans. Just to review very quickly some of the research here. One of the first papers to ring the bell on this came from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, you can see the paper here. It looked at nitrate for people in Iowa. You can see the different levels here. And as the levels increased, there was a statistically significant increase in the levels of bladder cancer and ovarian cancer. And I want you to note what their highest quartile was, 2.46 milligrams per liter, significantly lower than our average. Uh, and then just this year, uh, one of my favorite scientists now at the National Institutes of Health, Mary Ward, who has been a pioneer in looking at this research through the years, published probably one of the more comprehensive studies in the United States, and she's from the National Institutes of Health. And she saw that when the levels of nitrate in drinking water was above two milligrams per liter compared to what most of the country has, there were significantly higher rates of bladder cancer. Go to Denmark and look at the Department of Public Health there. Study of millions of individuals over almost four decades saw a significant increase in the risk of col colorectal cancer 
uh, when the levels get above 3.8 milligrams per liter. And again, I want you to note these concentrations. And here's that paper from Duke University and also the Environmental Working Group from last year, uh, essentially looking at what happens when you have uh, high levels of nitrate in drinking water. And again, it leads to thousands of cases of very low birth weight, um, potentially attributable to more than 12,000 cancer cases per year, an economic cost of $8 billion. And they determined scientifically that the 1 in a million cancer risk is at 0 0.14 milligrams per liter. Now that's just one in a million, but we know that with that, once you know that number, the risk goes higher when you get to higher concentrations. And the last thing I just want to point out, um, the New York State Department of Health tracks cancers across New York State. And uh, if you look at just a couple of cancers that can be associated with nitrate, I'll just point out, you look across Long Island, uh, in New York City, for example, here, bladder cancer is below average, closer to the city, but some clusters that are above average. Uh, in and around Suffolk County, areas with high levels of nitrate, and a similar pattern for kidney cancer. So now, one question is, you know, what's going on and why is this being looked at? Well, actually, it is being looked at. So the EPA is now under uh, a ass new assessment plan for looking at nitrate and nitrite in drinking water uh, as of September 2017. And when you see why, you can see what they're stating here. Uh, health studies published recently, since 1991, have called into question whether EPA's current maximum nitrate contamination levels provide adequate health protection. So there is 10 milligrams per liter now, but it may be going lower and for potentially good reasons. Uh, because in Suffolk County, we have very high levels uh, and you know, the epidemiological evidence is growing on the potential effects of high levels of nitrate in drinking water. And again, thankfully, we have a government that is looking out for nitrogen in drinking water. Uh, as you may know, Suffolk County published their sub-watersheds plan. Um, uh, it was put out in 2019, and it was recently adapted um, by the Suffolk County Legislature. In the plan, they show very, very clearly that when you increase the amount of nitrogen that's going coming from land to sea, that's what's shown in this table here, the nitrogen going into the water increases, the amount of nitrogen in the water increases, the oxygen levels get lower, the occurrence of harmful algal blooms uh, increases, the chlorophyll levels increase, and the water clarity decreases. And that's why this plan um, uses that science and identifies regions for upgrading septic systems. Again, on-site septic systems what treat the wastewater for more than 70% of homes across Suffolk County. So this plan has identified in uh, phase one and phase two, more than 170,000 systems to be upgraded. These are ones that are near water bodies, so within the two year travel time. And also importantly, these are areas, they're targeting areas where our drinking water is to protect human health. Um, so uh, thankfully a very forward looking plan, looking at it for human health, um, not waiting for the EPA ruling, but looking out for it right now and looking out to protect our service waters. And within the subwatersheds plan, there's a, two very interesting maps that um, you can call them choose your own adventure maps. I got this quote from Chris Clapp from the Nature Conservancy. And essentially the maps are, here's what our groundwater will look like if we do nothing. And here's if we put the subwatersheds plan in place. If you can't see the details of the text here, I can just tell you that anything that's yellow, orange, or red is more than four milligrams per liter. So an increase from what we have now on average. And again, those are the levels that are a human health effect as well, and certainly levels that are harmful to coastal ecosystems. And you can see, here's the do nothing plan. And you can see Western Suffolk County being almost entirely in that yellow, orange, red zone, and many pockets on the forks of Long Island and the shorelines as well. But you can see with that plan, um, decisive action can lead to improved groundwater quality. And just very quickly mention, um, I actually, working with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, finished a Nassau County subwatersheds plan. The interesting thing there is if you look at the North Shore of Nassau County, the nitrogen loading looks very, very similar to all of Suffolk County. And that is, for example, here are some regions between uh, Cold Spring Harbor, Oyster Bay, Long Island Sound, 
and then also further west, you can see most of the nitrogen coming from on-site septic systems. Very different on the south shore, it's, there it's mainly sewer. But the north shore of Nassau County looking very much like Suffolk County. And as part of the study, I'll just point out, we compared water bodies across the country uh, and saw, or across the world really, and saw that, for example, some of the uh, estuaries had nitrogen levels far beyond what you could find almost anywhere else um, in the country even in the world. Um, so just to now wind up the nitrogen loading summary here um, and move on to the, the what I call the final section, um, here I've shown you that nitrogen loading uh, intensifies as algal blooms and hypoxia. It's driving the new invasive algae known as daisy, daisy siphona, uh, and this is a threat to aquatic life, public health, and our economy. And I haven't dwelled on climate change here, but if we did, I, you'd know, and I would tell you that as climate change accelerates, these threats will intensify. Um, but again, thankfully, we do have policies in place uh, to try to deal with these things and try to transform our coastal ecosystems from the current state where our fisheries are in decline, our habitats are in decline, uh, to a state where habitats may hopefully begin to recover. And have, think about how we're gonna deal with, you can see here the 500,000 uh, septic tank question for Long Island, it's 360,000 for Suffolk County, but as I showed you, Nassau County is in the same boat, maybe to a little bit lesser extent. And again, the problems we're having is because the existing systems we have allow their nitrogen simply to leach right into the groundwater. Um, several years ago, um, Four or five years ago, Suffolk County passed Article 19, which approved multiple um, high, what we call in, innovative and alternative on-site wastewater treatment systems um, that reduce nitrogen to very low levels. So anybody now can install any of these systems in their home. In fact, Suffolk County has a grants program where you can get a grant uh, to install these for little to no cost. And if you live on the, um, some of the eastern Long Island towns, you can get additional grants to fund these sorts of installations. Um, at Stony Brook University, um, I, I run the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology, where we're also working on this issue. And uh, we have a goal we call 10 10 30. And that is, we want to reduce, we want to create on site septic systems or have on site septic systems for Long Island that get nitrogen levels below 10 milligrams per liter that costs less than $10,000 and will last at least 30 years. And our first foray into doing this is something we call nitrogen removing biofilters. Um, you can see the concept here. Essentially, it's an add-on to existing septic systems. Uh, they're fairly simple in design. Uh, they have a layer of sand that nitrifies um, wastewater nitrogen and then a layer with sand and wood chips mixed in that lead to something known as denitrification, to get the nitrogen out of the wastewater. Um, we have a few different iterations of these. I won't linger on the details, but in some cases, we line that layer of wood chips and sand. In other cases, we leave them unlined. And in yet another case, we go from the sand layer into a tank of wood chips. Uh, this allows us to access that tank, replace those wood chips if needed. Um, and actually, this is one of our best performing systems. Now we first created these systems years ago and we installed them in Massachusetts at a test center. They were running for three and a half years and over that time you can see they've all kept very low levels of nitrogen in the effluent coming out compared to the influent what they're receiving. We've installed many of these systems across Suffolk County as well. Um, you can see the unlined, the lined, and the box system. And in nearly every single case, we're getting nitrogen levels that are below that goal of ours of 10 milligrams per liter. Um, and al always, uh, almost always uh, below the county standard, which is 19 milligrams per liter. And we're very proud of the fact that compared to commercial systems, um, our systems are actually performing better and outperforming those other systems. So um, we've only been at it since 2015, but since that time, we have developed these systems that are getting nitrogen levels lower than commercially available systems, and we think that's gonna be very important in the future. And beyond nitrogen, again, we, work, we drink what's coming out of, we, we drink what's coming out of our septic systems, unfortunately, because it's going to our groundwater. Uh, and these systems are also removing drugs and pharmaceuticals that we do not want in our drinking water supply. So here you can see uh, a dozen different drugs, pharmaceuticals, uh, personal care products, 
And you can see the removal efficiencies for our systems, typically 90% or better for all of these compounds. And uh, this graph is way too busy, but beyond these 12, we recently expanded this to two dozen. You can see many other compounds that are in here, many other pharmaceuticals and drugs. Uh, the bars show you how much is being removed. In many cases, it's 75% or higher. The symbols show what a sewage treatment plant would remove. And so what you can see is that in most cases, we're getting removal rates that are far better than a sewage treatment plant. And a final compound I'll just mention that we really want to reduce is a uh, expected carcinogen, defined so by the EPA, known as 1,4-dioxane. Um, this is usually an industrial solvent. However, it's recently emerged that this compound is enriched in a lot of household products. Um, so it has to be low in our drinking water, but what I'm showing you here is water coming out of a home and water coming out of one of our septic systems. And so for perspective, New York State has a proposed and probably soon to be approved drinking water standard for 1,4-dioxane of one microgram per liter. And so what you can see is that the water coming out of homes are usually above that, mainly because of household products, but that our systems are getting the levels far below that. Uh, and actually that was surprising to us because this is a very difficult compound to remove. Uh, you get almost no removal from a wastewater system, but in our systems, we, we are consistently getting the levels down below a microgram per liter. So, and, and other exciting news with regards to these nitrogen removing biofilters, we're getting our installation costs down. Uh, we're starting to get into the ring. We're not at our $10,000 goal yet. Um, that's still our goal, but we're not there. Uh, but we are getting in the range of some other commercial systems. Uh, we're getting out of what we were, what are known as the experimental phase for these systems. We're now moving on to the piloting phase and we hope to be provisionally approved by 2021. And beyond that system, we're also innovating on new systems. Our associate director, Frank Russo, has designed the system. He calls the intermediate biofilter. I won't go through all the details here. He has a provisional patent on this technology. Uh, but the important thing is that he's been testing it, and we've been testing it along with scientists at the university uh, for more than a half a year um, at our what we call wastewater research and innovation facility that's receiving real wastewater right next to the Stony Brook campus. Uh, and the effluent coming out of this system is consistently less than two milligrams per liter. And we're going to have a, um, a pilot stage system to put into the ground for this in the coming months. And so the last thing I want to talk about are what I'll call a couple of in-water solutions um, because, of course, we must upgrade these septic systems and address wastewater. But in many cases, the travel time for uh, groundwater that's contaminated may be decadal. And so we also need approaches in the water to deal with the nitrogen that's going to get into the, uh, our coastal waters no matter what happens. And at the Center for Clean Water Technology, we're working on things like permeable reactive, permeable reactive barriers to intercept that groundwater and remove the nitrogen. Uh, but I would just want to talk about two what we call in the water approaches. Uh, specifically, I want to start with seaweeds. Um, seaweeds are known as nutrient sponges. They can very quickly take up uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and other compounds. And we've recently, uh, specifically Mike Dole, uh, who is the uh, bivalve restoration specialist in my lab, has been working on integrating the growth of seaweeds into oyster farms. In fact, he's done that on multiple farms, more than a half dozen across Long Island, um, with the idea being that the seaweeds can be put in the same exact space as the oyster farms, uh, and therefore you don't need any extra space. Uh, so they're vertically integrated, and they're removing nitrogen and phosphorus. So you can see the title I have here, regenerative and restorative, whoops, regenerative and restorative aquaculture. So we're, we're growing things that can be consumed, so bivalves and even the seaweeds could be consumed, and we're not adding anything to it. In fact, instead of adding feed like you might do for aquaculture fish, we're actually removing uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. We're removing carbon dioxide, which leads to ocean acidification. We're adding oxygen. Um, so this is an approach that's improving water quality and potentially leading to jobs. So here are just some pictures of the aquaculture on a few of the oyster farms uh, that we've been growing on through the years. And uh, our results this year uh, have been staggering. We actually doubled the output of kelp. Uh, we thought we were only going to be able to get uh, something like four pounds per foot of kelp uh, 
grown in an aquaculture setting. And this year we got more than eight pounds per foot. Um, so this is really uh, uh, taking off. Uh, and beyond just growing it on, on farms, we've also pioneered uh, a dock system where we're able to, again, Craig Young has done this work where we're growing during the summer, uh, Gracilaria and other seaweeds right in a modular dock just like this. And you can see that dock can slip into a regular boat slip. So this could have applications for all across Long Island. And I just want to point out, uh, one of these innovative and alternative septic systems can remove about 15 pounds of nitrogen per year. Um, but we're seeing that with that dock, we can remove similar amounts of nitrogen. Uh, if we look at kelp during the winter months when it grows and then transition to say grass area during the warmer months, together we can be taking out a significant amount of nitrogen. And I will say this graph does not account for the doubling in the amount of kelp production we had this year. So this is probably an underestimate. And then the final approach I want to talk about is bivalves. Uh, specifically, uh, we all know that bivalves do a great job of filtering the water and controlling harmful algal blooms. This is a famous experiment that was done during a brown tide. And you can't see the bottom of this tank. Uh, it doesn't have any clams in it, but this one does. It has about a dozen clams. And you can see these clams kept that water clear. And that's what high levels of bivalves can do. Uh, we know that the landings of bivalves declined by 99% of the south of Long Island. And with that, we had a tremendous loss of filtration pressure. And therefore, there's great interest in rebuilding these populations. Now, for decades, since the collapse of the clam industry uh, in the 80s, people have been putting out individual seed clams uh, and hoping to restore the bay that way. We've been taking a different approach out in Shinnecock Bay with a program called the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program where we've planted more than 3 million adult hard clams in spawner sanctuaries across Shinnecock Bay. These spawner sanctuaries are adults, and the whole purpose is not to have them just filter the water, but actually to have them repopulate uh, the rest of the estuary. You can see they're close together to maximize fertilization success. Uh, the net tidal transport is from the west to the east, so the idea by putting them up in these enclosed areas in the western bay, we can then repopulate the entire system. And the results of this restoration effort have been astonishing. We began in 2012, and what I'm showing you here is the change in hard clam landings since that time. Um, the dashed line just shows that this is a provisional number, um, but the landings have gone up enormously over time, uh, more than 700% increase. Um, and these landings are specifically of small clams. I won't belabor the details here, but we're seeing an emergence of small clams coming, we believe, from those spawner sanctuaries. You can see here almost a 1,700% increase in the landings of clams uh, before our restoration project. You can see it was less than half of the clams being harvested or little necks. It's now almost two thirds of those clams. Uh, so that means there's recruitment that's happened since we began our project. And when we look actually in the bay and the clams that are present, what we're seeing is over time an emergence of small clams repopulating the bay. And in parallel, we've actually seen an interesting, in the same exact system, as the clams have come back, this is the densities of brown tides since we began our effort. And so you can see the last two years were the only two years uh, in more than 20 that there's been two consecutive years without a brown tide. In fact, this is a program that's now being replicated. We, uh, met with uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo and discussed this program with him out in Southampton a few years ago. Um, he liked the plan, and we have since begun to expand that plan to other locations all across uh, Long Island. And, um, and quoting the governor, this is actually his slide and his quote, and he would say, it's up to us to leave our world better, safer, healthier than we found it. And I couldn't agree more. So with that, I'm done, uh, and I'll just wrap up mentioning that uh, the mishandling of wastewater has been contaminating the groundwater of Long Island, that it's our drinking water supply, and has also been seeping into coastal waters, and that excessive nitrogen levels in coastal waters uh, is a threat to coastal ecosystems, coastal economies, pets, and even public health. And again, we talked about the invasion of the um, harmful seaweed. I mentioned our science paper that fish kills we're having may be in part due to policies that need to be adjusted. And I showed you the data about public health, the public health threat that nitrate is at the levels we see in Suffolk County.
Uh, but I've also showed you that we do have septic systems now that can lead to significantly lower levels of nitrogen, uh, as well as remove organic contaminants, including carcinogens, uh, and that we also need other efforts, what I call in the water efforts, uh, to restore uh, our coastal ecosystems. So with that, I'm done, and I thank you for your attention. And with that, I am going to try to work with uh, my assistant, Mark Lang, and try to take on some questions. And so you should have an option, everyone, uh, if you go under if you click on participants, you should then see at the very bottom a blue hand. Um, and within that, you could then um, raise your hand. And if you do that, I will unmute you and then answer your question. So I so see you have a first question here. I'll look to take that. We have uh, Chris Gonzalez. Chris, uh, let's see. Go ahead. Hi, should the ordinary consumer uh, take steps to filter their drinking water until the state standard for nitrates in the water is reduced? Well, I think it, uh, it's a very good question. And I think it really depends on what the nitrate levels are. And, um, you know, again, there are many places where the nitrate levels are low. And again, this is emerging data. So, you know, we're, we're still working with medical scientists on how to best interpret that data. Um, but, you know, certainly having water uh, that with lower levels of nitrate, if you can achieve that via filtration, um, I don't think there's a downside to that necessarily. Okay, I see a question from uh, Paul Stacy. And let me see if I can get you unmuted here. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was a little bit confused about your comparison between septic systems and grass area removal of nitrogen. How do you um, uh, equilibrate those two removal systems with each other? Yes, great question, and thank you for asking that. If it wasn't clear, it's a great question. So what we did is we compared for an average home on Long Island, uh, where the, there's on average a little more than two people per home, again, on average, we calculated the amount of nitrogen that one of those systems can remove. And then I was comparing that to that modular dock system that we've created, right? And so that system, we, in, in that system, we're growing seaweeds year round, uh, growing kelp in the winter, growing grass filaria in the summer. Uh, and so if you add up the nitrogen extraction from that dock system, um, it's close to what you get from an IA system, a typical IA system, not the nitrogen using biofilters, but a typical one. Uh, of course, there's a lot more effort in harvesting and growing that macroalgae, but really it was just a demonstration to show um, the effectiveness of uh, seaweeds as a nutrient sponge. Again, if other people have questions, uh, the way you would do that is if you look at the bar at the bottom of your Zoom, you can click on participants. And in doing so, you should see a blue hand. And if you click on that blue hand, I will then be able to answer your question. So here's another one. We have Thomas Schultz. Uh, Thomas, go ahead. Hey, Professor. It's Thomas Schultz from Friends of Belport Bay. As you know, we're um, heavily involved with shellfish restoration efforts. Is there a point where you can have enough viable, healthy shellfish populations in a given body of water to truly counter brown tide or other algae blooms as they occur as a as a mitigation strictly um, as a mitigation effort is there a number that you can get in place to truly fight back the brown tides when they occur each summer now that's a great question and the answer actually is yes and so when i worked with uh, governor cuomo's staff to develop the long island shellfish restoration program a guiding principle that we used was we want to have enough bivalves to turn over the water column, essentially filter the water column in three days. That three day metric has essentially been shown that if you can do that, that's a level whereby um, you can keep those brown tides and other algae blooms under control. And so that, that's our ultimate goal. So we're not, um, and, and, it, and so it doesn't, it's not a number of clams because it's also, well it's a number of clams, but it's, it's estuary specific, but that is, that's the overall approach. Okay. Chris, uh, I have a question that I got in the chat. Okay, uh, go, go ahead, Mark. 
It was um, how is the or how are the atmospheric nitrogen deposition percentages measured uh, that you showed in your pie charts? That's a great question. So when we look at atmospheric deposition, there are stations set up by federal agencies uh, on Long Island and in nearby regions, and they're capturing what is known as both wet and dry deposition. So we can all grasp very easily the idea, well, it's raining and there's nitrogen that rain and that's going to be landing uh, on and getting into our water. But interestingly, there's also something known as dry deposition. So even on a, uh, a day when it's not raining, the, there is nitrogen raining down uh, on Long Island as well. Uh, and that's captured from these stations, these deposition stations set up by federal agencies. And those rates are then put into these models. Um, so that's, that's the answer there. Um, I have, uh, let's see, looks like I'm gonna unmute. We got Kamazima, Dr. Dr. Kamazima Louisa. Uh, Kamazima, so good to hear from you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, towards the end, you showed a slide where most of the uh, components were decreasing, but there was one which spiked off was out of the, of the, of the, normal trend could you allude on to what was the cause of that it was a like triple bar graph so kind of popping out not not quite decreasing uh well let's see i guess I'm this was sure. towards the very end you, you towards the end. <laughs> let's see this one Yes. It was this one. Yeah. Good. That's a great question, Kamazima. And thank you for asking. Because uh, I wanted to mention. And so, 20, and I have two things to say here. And that is one, there is going to be year to year variability. Um, and two, 2016 was a year where it was very warm in the spring. Uh, and therefore, this, the system was set up to, uh, that tends to favor brown tides. Right, and so, um, and, and I, I'll also just say that I'm not, uh, I can't predict that I don't think that we've seen the ends of brown tides necessarily. Um, in fact, we, you know, the brown tide could return, but I think we've made the system more resilient and less likely to have brown tides because we do have this additional filtration pattern. And so I think, you know, j just like in comes in with the, the equivalent here is just like hypoxia in Long Island Sound where the trend, the size of the dead zone has been decreasing as nitrogen loads have gone down. But if you get a warm year, it could spike up. Uh, so I think it's sort of similar to that. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you for your question. Okay, uh, we have a question here from, um, let's see, Larissa. She's unmuted. Working on getting that unmuted. Hi, as you've identified seaweeds to be solutions to remove nutrient loads in salt water, are there recommendations for removal in freshwater bodies? That's a good question. And, um, you know, there some options would be having uh, aquatic plants that could take up nitrogen. Um, you know, certainly all the watershed based approaches are appropriate for freshwater bodies, so addressing septic systems. Um, we have had success, uh, for example, in East Hampton, a water body known as Georgica Pond. Uh, we use something known as an aquatic weed harvester to remove the overgrowth of seaweeds. Uh, that was very successful. So there are a few approaches. They're quite different than the marine systems, but um, they, are, they, they, they can be used for freshwater. Okay, I have Bob Moser. Hi, Bob. Yeah, hi, Chris. Um, hey, thanks for you know for doing this, and I and I hope this actually uh, this approach to your presentations actually engages more people in the communities uh, than you know having to travel to, uh, to to Southampton. I've certainly promoted this on our local Facebook group here in Remsenburg and Spion. Uh, so I, I'd be curious to see how, you know, how the, the response level is to this uh, approach to it. And I guess we've been kind of forced into it with the, uh, with the COVID issue. Um, but my, my question is, um, you know, I'm a hydrogeologist by profession and 
I, I'm a, a person that's more interested in sort of passive systems than, you know, not to say that, that something is highly engineered, but something that requires less O&M every year than the systems that have been proposed. And I'm, I'm more interested on a personal level here at my home in Remsenburg, in, and I'm very close to, to the Bay. Uh, I'm more interested in, in a system that is more passive and, and your, uh, your concept that's been presented that involves a, a separate tank that contains the organic material, the carbon source for the denitrification that could be um, you know, uh, eventually replaced as needed, uh, coupled with an existing septic system is of tremendous in interest to me. And I'm just curious as to whether or not, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for me personally, as well as others, to be part of a pilot program, or in the long term, a, a program that would involve, you know, a less, you know, O&M intensive system um, than something more passive. Yeah, great question. And so we are, um in the process of installing these at different homes. And so I think um, I can talk to you offline about the details there, but um, again, right now it's in the piloting stage. And, uh, we, and then once that's done, the piloting stage, they will be being provisionally approved. Uh, anyone will be able to install them. But we are uh, looking for place to install them. So we can certainly um, look into that and ask people, uh, if you wanted to volunteer, we can certainly look into uh, that as a possibility. Okay, we have this question here from uh, Colin Bennett. Go ahead, Colin. Hey, Dr. Gober. So um, I want to know your personal opinion on which, if you think rotophytes or chlorophytes are more effective at nutrient removal and what you think would be a better solution for Long Island sp specifically. That's a great question. And I think, you know, the, the, the honest answer is we just don't know, right? So that is, we have, there just hasn't been enough research on, uh, you know, see, so we just don't know. It's a really, a, it's a new topic. It's an emerging topic. Uh, the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan has a bio extraction uh, component, and that's begun to look at things like kelp. Um, uh, and then, you know, in the summer, certainly you have chloroflites, you have chloroflites like ulva, rotophytes like um, Gracilaria. Uh, but really, you know, the research just has to be done to determine that. Uh, and I think it might be even site specific. So we, we can, we've done some work showing in some places and times, Olva will outgrow Gracilaria, and then we also see the reverse. So, um, you know, we know which species are the best, things like Olva and Gracilaria, but, um, you know, I think there needs to be more research to better understand um, you know, which is best at each location. Okay, we have a question here for New York Sea Grant. It must be one individual, however. Um, go ahead. Is that me? I don't know why this says New York. My name's Barbara Pierce. And Hi. my question oh, just, is just New York. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. But anyway, um, I, I like the uh, combination of growing the seaweed, the shellfish. And I was just wondering if there's a sufficient market for the seaweed to make that worthwhile or what happens to the seaweed? That's a great question. And so, you know, right now, um, the sea, first sea seaweeds in general serve many purposes. Uh, it's a great food additive. Uh, it can actually be a food product in many places. Um, currently in New York, you cannot eat, you can't grow and sell seaweed as a food product yet. Um, but I will say in my research and my lab, one thing that we have been doing and had great success with, I haven't really didn't show it today in the interest of time, but we've created fertilizers uh, out of these seaweeds. In fact, we've created uh, two different products where uh, I've, in my past day of the base presentation, I've shown people the chemical composition of miracle Grow side by side with the chemical composition of our seaweed products uh, without the labels and challenged the audience to differentiate them. And the bottom line is you can't because they look exactly the same. Uh, and we've had some spectacular results uh, just last year and uh, essentially getting, uh, by supplementing soils with these seaweed fertilizers, 
Uh, in some cases, doubling, for example, the size of eggplants, doubling the number of tomatoes, um, getting plant flowers that are, you know, plants with more flowers. So, um, you know, food is on the horizon, but right now our group, our lab group is mainly focused on uh, uh, the possibility of turning that seaweed into fertilizer. And of course, if we do that, we're then not importing more fertilizer onto Long Island. Okay, I have a question from... Uh, We've got a question in the chat real quick, Chris. Okay, yeah, could you, could you read that out more? Yep, it's, uh, what are the levels of nitrogen typically in drinking water provided by the Suffolk County Water Authority? Right, so that depends on your district. And so, you know, it can range, it, 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 uh, it can be less than one, um, it can be more than seven, more than eight. Uh, it's never more than 10, um, but there's a, you know, there's a wide range. It really depends on uh, where, where you are in Long Island. Uh, and again, the, the general average is about 3.8. Okay, uh, Jennifer Katz has a question. Go ahead, Jennifer. If you want, I got to hold on. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, seaweed and using macroalgae as a nutrient sponge. Are there any uh, noticeable or things that you found as environmental downsides from that method? It's a good question. And so I would say the downside would be if, if you don't ultimately remove those seaweeds, what we know, as I showed, for example, for the um, uh, for the daisy siphona and its overgrowth within um, Great South Bay, if those seaweeds are left to decay, they can have ill effects on the ecosystem uh, and lead to low oxygen, be detrimental to larval fish, be detrimental to larval bivalves. And so um, that is the that would be an environmental downside if you just let it grow and then decay. So the whole idea is you you must as you grow it, you must be removing it. And then, and again, that idea of removing it, that's the bio extraction, that's getting it out of the ecosystem. Okay, I have a question here from Rich. Go ahead, Rich. Oops, sorry, you got me again, try this again. Sorry. Go ahead, Rich. I had trouble uh, unmuting. Um, in terms of the uh, sea level rise and the effect on the watersheds and the groundwater table, subsequently the sanitary systems. Is that something that you have looked at or uh, that you're going to be looking at in terms of uh, possible increases in nitrogen due to those systems being impacted by the higher water table? Yeah, that's a great question, Rich. Of course, one I didn't mention, but yeah, certainly with uh, sea level rise that, as you 100% correctly pointed out, that raises the groundwater table um, and when that happens, you can get the wastewater literally going then directly into uh, the groundwater and you get actually absolutely zero removal. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's something we, that's problematic and certainly is increasing. And of course, in the South Shore, uh, all across the South Shore, the, the, the water table is very, very shallow. Um, you know, we learned that the hard way during Hurricane Sandy, the, the, all the areas that got flooded. Um, you know, an exciting news, the nitrogen removing biofilters have a very shallow profile. They're only about uh, three feet in depth and can be modified to even more shallow. So those might be a good solution uh, for some of those locations. Um, let's see here. Got another question in the chat. Um, Great. If someone, uh, Julia reports that there's a lot of microalgae, excuse me, macroalgae in the bay near north of Smith Point. Um, it's, it's unpleasant to kayak in. Can we borrow the mower in Georgica? <laughs> well, that would be a good solution potentially, but um, yeah, that particular region, you know, it's downstream from the Forge River. The Forge River has historically had problems with both the overgrowth of macroalgae and then also the seasonal decay of those macroalgae. And so, um, you know, we do, there do need to be solutions. And, you know, in the, the good thing about Georgia Capone is that it was an enclosed system. When you get into an open estuary, it gets more complex. Um, you know, and that's why really addressing the, you know, the source is really the key to making, uh, uh, to solving 
solving the problems. Um, again, I'll just mention if anybody has any questions, if you go on the participants, you see the, the word participants on the bar, uh, you can go there and then specifically raise your hand. Uh, and I have a question from Roger Toss. Roger, go ahead. Oops, try once more. Hello, Chris. Yes, got you. There I'm you sorry, go. on the right button. Yeah, I just had a question uh, with respect to Peconic Bay saying that the uh, the levels of algae have been the same since 2004. Presumably that's by measuring chlorophyll. Uh, yet at that same time, we've had blooms that are harmful algae. We've had algae which are not edible to shellfish. Have you noticed at all at that period of time from 2004 to the present that the type of algae have been reduced in size or is there any change in the composition of the general non-harmful algae? That's a good question. And so in general, we haven't seen a lot of change in the size. Um, the data I was specifically referencing was actually since 2014, not 2004, because we started uh, chronically monitoring there. But if you took the Suffolk County data, you'd find the same thing. Um, if you look at the size fractionation over that time, it doesn't look like it's changing too much. Now, there are, of course, some what we call stochastic events like rust tide blooms, cochlidinian polyphacoides, in which case the chlorophyll levels get very, very high and the levels of chlorophyll get skewed, but those um, are occasional. They were more intense um, a few years ago. They're a little bit less intense now, but you know, from both microscopic examination and the size fractionation, if we compare the period where the scallop populus was rebuilding um, in the last decade plus, uh, to last year when the population collapsed, we cannot find any specific differences. Okay. Um, Got another question in the chat. Um, okay. Someone missed the point about the residential nitrogen removing septic systems. Did you say new, less costly systems have been approved by local municipalities? So currently, uh, well, first thing, in Suffolk County, it's the Suffolk County Department of Health Services that approves what types of systems can be installed. And to date, they've approved about six nitrogen uh, removing uh, on-site, innovative alternative on-site septic systems. Um, all to, to be approved, they had to have demonstrated that they can reduce nitrogen to below 19 milligrams per liter over a one year uh, piloting phase, um, and they've done that. So, um, and, and then I also mentioned that our systems, we're piloting those now, uh, and we're able to get even lower uh, than the 19 milligram per liter standard. Again, if anybody has any last questions, if you go into the participants zone and you click there, you should see a blue a uh, circle with a hand there, and if you click on that, you can raise your hand to answer a question. Um, alternatively, you can type it in the chat, or alternatively, oh, there we go. We have Rick Ballard here. Um, let's see if I can. Rick. I think I'm unmuted. Go ahead. Hey, 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 Chris, can you comment if non-agricultural fertilizer use is increasing or decreasing in loading? And if, should, and if we should eliminate non-agricultural fertilizer application that result in any uh, contributions to groundwater surface waters, and, and this is a first step as we work to install nitrogen removing septic systems. Sure, and so, you know, I think um, there, there's, some, there's some evidence that in recent years, uh, the amount of non-agricultural fertilizer use has increased. Um, that maybe wouldn't be surprising given that, you know, I think the story that I would tell is that, of course, growing up, everyone mowed their own lawn and took care of their own lawn and uh, judiciously used fertilizer because they had to pay for it and uh, they were buying the bags. And now that many people have lawn services uh, and those people make more money if they put down more fertilizer. Uh, so that's sort of anecdotal, but uh, that would say fertilizer levels are increasing. And, uh, and also, to your point, beyond the wastewater, be, wastewater is the most important sort of nitrogen in most watersheds. Fertilizer is almost always second, and there are some where fertilizer is the most. Um, and so certainly, uh, 
the idea of being able to very quickly address fertilizer loading uh, by changing a policy would have uh, probably a widespread effect. It's taking, it's going to take time. It's going to continue to take time to um, approve and install these on-site systems. Uh, so it's possible that a, a change in the law all at once uh, could be equally effective, at least over the short term, uh, in addressing nitrogen loading. So that's a uh, good point, Rick, and I'm glad you, uh, glad you brought it up. Okay, well, I think we're at the- uh, We've got one more uh, uh, question in the chat here, it looks like. Sure, sure. Uh, it says, currently Suffolk uh, County Department of Health Services has a backlog for home well testing out of the tap. Does your lab perform these tests and where is the source for tests for the test element, including emerging, emerging contamin contaminants? Uh, any sources that are better? Yeah, so, um, you know, there are labs. I wouldn't, uh, this right now, I'm not going to recommend my lab. Uh, we're, uh, a lot of restrictions due to COVID concerns and we're just sort of restarting. Uh, but there are uh, different analytical labs out there. I can think of, for example, Long Island Analytical, Pace Analytical Labs that are on Long Island um, and do uh, groundwater testing. Um, and uh, So they would be, again, Pace Analytical and Long Island Analytical would be alternatives to, um, to Suffolk County Department of Health. Okay, so with that, I am going to say thank you to you all. I very much appreciate everyone's attention. I'm excited to see how many participants we had uh, today and this evening. Um, I hope uh, the presentation was useful. And if people have questions down the road, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, I encourage you to keep track of uh, what the Gober Lab is up to. And um, you can track us on social media. I'll just finally point out once again, uh, you can track us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Um, I appreciate your attention. And with that, I will say good night, everyone. And thank you.